Thanks very much. Um, what I am primarily going to do this morning, for those of you who are Westminster-based journalists, is basically to say you shouldn't be here. Or at least if you are going to follow the sports election, you need to draw your Westminster prison. Um, and you'll see why I'm saying that as we go along. Okay. Um, first thing it's always useful to do if we're talking about elections is to remind you about what happened last time, because sometimes people fail to look at what happened last time and therefore mis misinterpret what might be going on now. Um, of course, the headline was that the SNP won an overall majority. They won an overall majority in around 45% of the vote, and the Labour Party suffered a, a pretty significant disaster. Um, Labour's constituency vote was markedly higher than this vote, primarily because quite a few of its uh, its constituency MSPs were trying to defend their seats, clearly had a personal vote, and one or two cases had helped them to save their seat, but in many cases it didn't. The crucial thing, however, probably to bear in mind is how badly, first of all, the Liberal Democrats did. This is the first election after the tuition fees fiasco, and although Tavish Scott, Benjamin and Say, who was then the Liberal Democrats, I do not agree with Nick Cake about the tuition fees. Um, the Scottish voters meted out their own. Um, uh, justice on the Liberal Democrats on the border. So the Liberal Democrats are defending a very, very poor baseline. There probably is no way to go that up, but you'll see that maybe even that's not true at the moment. The other thing to bear in mind is the Tories also didn't do terribly well. Even by the standards of the Conservatives in Scotland, they didn't do that well either. So it would be a relatively straightforward for the Tories to go up. Finally, the Greens came in at 4% of the vote. That's just too low for them. One of the things to bear in mind about how votes get translated seats in Scotland is that you need to get between 5 and 6% of the vote to, uh, to get past the de facto threshold to get allocated to this seat. And the Greens, for the most part, were just below it rather than just above it. So uh, the outcome of the elections are quite sensitive to whether or not the Greens are at 4 or whether they are at 6. OK, where are we now? Well, we're with the SNP even further ahead than they were in 2011, doing more or less as well as they did in the 2015 UK general election, Scotland, and of course they got 50% of the vote. The Labour Party is down in an even worse position than they were 12 months ago. They're running about a fifth of the vote, which, if it transpires into ballot boxes, will be Labour's worst ever performance north of the border. Will be lower even than 1918, which is the first election the party fought as a separate party. The Conservatives, as you can see, are doing moderately well. That is, they're doing as well as they did in 1997 when they lost all their MPs north of the border. But by the standard of the Conservative Party these days, 17% is good. And because but the primary reason why we have been talking about a race, unquote, for second place, is not because the Conservatives are particularly going anywhere. It's just the Labour Party are just going deeper and deeper into the hole into which they have fallen. The Labour Democrats, no sign at all, contrary to perhaps some of the evidence of the English Federal Government by elections, and certainly no evidence of the opinion of the the water that they are stationary in the recovery. Notice that the Greens, however, are polling fairly consistently above the Liberal Democrats, and that therefore one of the buffers is going on is also a buffer for fourth which is, in effect, a battle for major party status. I think we can probably presume that if the Greens overtake the Democrats, the Democrats will no longer be regarded as the private broadcasters as a major party north of the border, and Scotland will have a three plus two party system. UKIP exists north of the border, but it's much more weaker than any down in Wales, and at the moment, most opinion polls suggest they're not going to get past the five to six percent threshold. Their best prospects in the Highlands and Islands with David Coburn is actually the lead candidate. So, um, what does this mean in terms of seats? Well, um, if you extrapolate from those polls that we got, we're talking about the SNP with another overall majority. Um, Labour, perhaps just ahead of the Conservatives, but horribly close, and the Greens are polling the Liberal Democrats. So that's where we could go. Virtually all of these seats, by the way, are seats that you would project to be coming from the constituencies, not from the list. And most opinion polls projected, using the standard model arithmetic, project the SNP getting an overall majority on the basis of constituency vote seats alone. And they may indeed possibly only end up with the seats in the Highlands Lines, which has led to a whole debate inside the National Movement about whether or not SNP voters should be voting for the SNP on this vote or not. But that's another story. 
One health warning, however, I should say, well, there's always lots of health warnings about premium polls, but one particular health warning I should give you is about this gap here. Um, the opinion polls in 2011 said the SMP were going to do for marketing, that's why the list vote. That's why the overall majority was not anticipated. But one of the problems with polling in Scotland is pollsters, they go and say, okay, who are you going to vote for? <coughs> you vote for the SMP. Oh, by the way, you've got another vote. So what are you going to do on that? And it's pretty clear if you look at the polling evidence that some people give their second preference in response to that question. And therefore, it may be that this underestimates how well the SMP might do. Who knows? But in particular, I think because therefore it means that this is uncertain, it means this is uncertain. And in a sense, the most important vote in Scotland of the two votes in Scotland is rather difficult to call exactly. Okay. So why are, we, why are we where we are? Well, there are some things that um, it's obviously, fairly obvious that the SNP have advantages on. They do have a relatively popular leader. This is from Prime Minister's poll on Sunday. And what's also true is that Ruth Davidson is remarkably popular for a Conservative north of the border. She is actually clearly more popular than Kelsey Dugdale. And there was actually a poll last week which people were actually asked, who do you think make, make the better leader of the opposition? and Ruth Davidson clearly came out ahead. But it's clear that Nicola Sturgeon is a relatively popular politician, so that's one of those things that work in their favour. Second thing that works in their favour is that for the most part, people in Scotland think they've done quite a good job of running the country, and they certainly don't think the Labour Party would make a good job of running the country if they've been in power. That's very, very strikingly clear. But the election campaign itself is not primarily being fought about the SNP's record, it's being fought primarily about the issue of taxation. This, of course, is the first Scottish election to be fought since the Scottish Parliament uh, began, begins to inherit the significant powers of income tax, which in 12 months' time will mean that the uh, income tax over earned income will be almost fully devolved north of the border, and the Scottish Parliament has to set a set an income tax. It partially comes in this year, partially comes in next year. Um, and the parties have been arguing primarily about what to do on taxation. Now, see if I can get all this right. It's horribly complicated. The Tories want to do nothing. Stick where we are, follow George Osborne. The SNP have said we will not fully implement George Osborne's increase in the, for, in the threshold for the 40p rate, but otherwise we also will do nothing. Notice their position. But if the Democrats say we should increase the penny on income tax for everybody, the Labour Party is saying you should do that and you shouldn't, you shouldn't raise the 40p rate as much as George uh, Osborne and you should also in, 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 introduce a 50p rate for the top rate in Scotland. And the Greens have also got proposals that are even more complicated, which effectively mean that people on high incomes would have to pay more. So there are big diversions. So notice in particular, for those of you with long memories, back in 1999, and the Scottish Parliament was already in theory had some tax cars, the SNP were arguing for a penny for Scotland, and the Labour Party was saying, now you keep the penny cut in income tax that George Brown is just about to give you. The parties have completely reversed their position. <coughs> One of my favourite questions uh, last week with I was chairing the debate was to ask Nicholas Sturgeon, so if it's wrong, if it's right to increase the penny at Scotland um, 15 years ago, why is it wrong now? To which our answer was, I'm not, I wasn't the leader in 1999. So there you go. We know where this stance comes from. Um, so the question, therefore, is where does public opinion stand on this issue? Does Scotland want higher taxation in order to have less and more public expenditure cuts, or does it not? Well, some evidence that perhaps, depending on how you sell it, maybe Scotland does. Certainly, if you say to people, should we do this in order to be able to improve public services, you get 51% in favour and 36% against. Increasing welfare, no, that's not such as popular. Even in Scotland, welfare is not that popular. But, so in one sense, it looks as though Scotland thinks it's quite a good idea. However, um, what Panelways did at the weekend was to actually test the messages of the parties on taxation, and then you see the problem. All right? Actually, overwhelmingly people in Scotland said, no, the taxation in Scotland should be the same in England. A clear majority of those people who voted yes to independence in the referendum think that the taxes in Scotland should be the same as they are in England, right? That's a really, England is still a really, really important point of comparison. The SNP argument, which is essentially we should be increasing tax in order to make the poor pay for uh, Tory austerity cuts, 
that has got a purchase. In contrast, it's not that the idea of these are two versions of this little girl cut policy, this little letter policy. It's not that they're wildly unpopular. Clearly, some people are saying don't do yes to this and yes to this, but they're not necessarily quite as popular twos as you might imagine. But in any event, Labour's real problem is it doesn't make any difference. Right? Here are the views of Labour voters on one of the questions I've shown you increase the penny in order to avoid cuts. Here are the view of SNP voters. People are going to vote for the SNP irrespective of whether or not they are closer to the Labour Party on the taxation issue. Which obviously lets us read all the debates about tax, but it looks as though tax is not actually moving the punters. Which therefore takes to so what is shaping the punters? Well, the first thing you have to realise if you haven't got it is that the 45 or 45% of people who voted for independence have not gone anywhere. They're still alive and kicking. Most opinion polls still find a small majority for many in the union, but it's small. It's typically around the order of 53, 47. And you can see all the most recent readings here. But the reason why this is crucial is that the independence question is now the central dividing line in Scottish politics. Here are, all, here are the, all four of the polls we've had so far, and as you can see, between 85 and 90 percent of those people who voted yes to independence are now saying they're going to vote for the SNP, and indeed last year, 85 to 90 percent of those people who voted for independence voted for the SNP. In contrast, Yes, there are some no voters who will vote for the SNP, but it's a much smaller group. This is a really, really big divide. This is the central dividing line of Scottish politics. You might be saying to yourself, well, surely it's always been like this. Oh, no, it's not. Um, back in 2010, this is using a slightly different question. This is not the referendum question on independence, but it still illustrates the point. Back in 2010, only 55% of those people who were in favour of independence on the Scottish Social Attitudes measure voted for the SNP. Now that went up in 2011, but notice also the very substantial proportion of people who weren't in favour of independence at that point, who were voting for the SNP. People voted for the SNP because they thought they could provide Scotland effective well done. Now the gap is much wider. Right? So what one has to realise therefore is that in having held the referendum, the central question of Scottish electoral politics is completely different from the central from the questions that are facing voters in England and maybe Wales, but I'll let Richard speak for himself. Um, and that therefore you cannot read anything at all from what happens in Scotland in May the 5th to what may or may not happen to Labour elsewhere in the UK in four years' time. And in particular, Jeremy Corbyn is an irrelevance in Scotland, and Scotland is irrelevant to understanding Jeremy Corbyn's future. Just bear in mind, the Scottish Labour Party is fighting on a platform to increase income tax. Now, neither Jeremy Corbyn nor John MacDonald has so far been as left-wing as that. So, but the crucial point is that, that the issue that's dividing votes, what voters will vote on, is not what they think of the Labour Party not that, that south of the border, it will be uh, what they think of the Labour Party north of the border. And this is just to remind you that with this social dividing line that's unique <coughs> to Scotland as opposed to England, the actual result in Scotland was completely different, apart from the Liberal Democrats in Scotland uh, than what it was in England. So don't therefore think you can find anything that tells you anything about England and Wales from what goes on in Scotland in this election. It's so generous, it's interesting, it's fascinating, because of course it reaches us into the incredible position that if I had said to you this in 1999, this is where we would end up and go, I don't believe you. We have now reached the incredible position where we're going, oh, the SNP are going to win again. Oh, how boring. <laughs> <laughs> because of course the SNP are not necessarily committed to holding a second referendum on independence, and therefore it may just be business as usual albeit in a country that's severely divided on the constitutional question. That said, there are important races for second and fourth. Uh, the election has highlighted <coughs> the importance of the tax devolution powers that Scotland is now getting, but it's not about tax, it's about independence, and that means forget Westminster. If you come north, wear tartan, and forget your Westminster background. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Richard, please. Uh, 
following John Curtis is always difficult because it A is John and B because Wales isn't as quite as sexy as Scotland apparently. Although I'm going to try and uh, persuade you. Uh, otherwise, good morning. Uh, um, what about that? Um, uh, I'll spend a little bit on the background. I'm assuming that you're all not quite bang up to date with the electoral system in Wales and its, and its effects. So, a little bit more background maybe before I go on to some of the polling evidence. I want to talk a little bit about the election uh, issues uh, that seem to be emerging. Um, tax is only one small part of the story. And I'm saying a little bit, I want to say a little bit about government formation. Um, and some of the slides uh, were made by my colleague uh, Roger Scully, and it's important that I give him credit. <laughs> so, in terms of Welsh politics, the old, you know, the dominant uh, fact of Welsh electoral politics is Labour dominance. Labour have been dominant in Wales since the First World War. They've won 36 out of 37 electoral contests in Wales in a row. Um, you know, people talk about one partyism in Scotland these days. You don't know you're born. Frankly. <laughs> uh, the only one that they, the only exception is the 2000, the weird aberration of the 2009 Euro election, which the Conservatives won, which I think was the first election the Conservatives have won in Wales since 1867. Okay, so, um, so Labour dominance is the overwhelming. Fact. However, Labour has been performing uh, relatively poorly in the last two general elections, uh, and indeed in the uh, last uh, <coughs> UK general election, Labour, the different, basically in the Welsh context, Wales always performs better in Wales than in England, and the Conservatives always performs worse in Wales than in England. But the differential in terms of Labour's votes last year was the lowest it's ever been. Uh, the thing which helps Labour is, as you'll see in a moment, that the challenge, if you like, is very divided. And that is, you know, one of the things which uh, hides uh, this decline. The electoral system, I want to say a word about this because it's actually important in terms of what we see next. So basically, uh, as John indicated earlier, in the AMS system, voters have two votes, one for constituencies, and one then for, for the regional lists. 40 of the 60 seats in the assembly are chosen by the constituencies or are elected from the constituencies, 20 from the lists. The um, first past the post, obviously, in the constituencies in the Welsh context is very disproportionate, very favourable to Labour. That's kind of compensated for slightly or to some extent through the lists but actually not to a very great extent. Now, the reason why this is important is this makes for a very, very sticky system, okay? So, quite large shifts in votes have pretty low impact in terms of shifts in seats. And that, you can see that uh, in terms of, if you look at um, what's happened in elections past, Basically, four parties have dominated electoral politics. We've had a couple of independents, but the Greens, for example, the threshold is higher in Wales on the list, so the Greens haven't really made a breakthrough, and UKIP haven't made a breakthrough until now. We'll talk about UKIP in a moment. But thus far, we've had Labour, the Conservatives, apply with the Dems. <coughs> Labour is always the largest party, but the range is actually quite narrow, between 26 and 30. So 26 was in the disastrous election of 1999, where Plaid Cymru, of course, did better than the SNP uh, in that election, won places like the Honda. Um, that was a disastrous uh, uh, election for the 26. Their triumph then in 2011 led them having 30 seats. Okay, so this is you know, it's a very narrow range. The Conservatives were third, the third party in the first three elections, then became the second party, so they displaced Plaikenberg as the official opposition last time round. And they've increased thus far their seats in every election since uh, the dawn of the evolution. Plaikenberg, conversely, have gone down in every election. The Lib Dems always come fourth. Uh, they, came, they got fifth, five seats in 2011. But, and this becomes important in a moment, they held some of those seats by the narrowest of narrow margins. So they performed, they you know, arguably outperformed 
uh, their party, the rest of the UK or the rest of Britain in 2011. However, interestingly and ominously, the Lib Dems performed worse in Wales last year than in Scotland and in England. And as we'll see, the prospects for them are pretty appalling. So this is the 2011 results, just to remind you, um, and the changes from 20, uh, and, sorry, 2007 in brackets. Labour, large party, Conservative second, applied second. Note here, you keep on the regional lists down 4.6%. Uh, so that was the picture back in 2011. This is the latest opinion poll uh, in Wales from last week. You go quite striking changes uh, in terms of Labour in particular have fallen substantially from where they were. I'll, I'll talk about changes in more detail in a moment. But you can see instantly that they've fallen quite a lot. Um, Conservatives applied neck and neck. Um, Lib Dems significantly below UKIP. UKIP up around 15%. Uh, obviously this becomes important when we look at the allocation of list seats. In terms of trends over time, this is basically the polling since the 2011 election in Wales. And what you see is a kind of gentle decline uh, with Labour. Well, it's not gentle over time, actually, it's quite significant. Uh, a cumulative uh, drop. Plaid and uh, the Conservatives neck and neck. The tour, the, interestingly, that the UKIP rise is relatively recent. Uh, it, it happens around 2014, and then they've been consistently well ahead of the Lib Dems uh, as the fourth party. And all Lib Dems, you know, they're just clinging on at the bottom there. Same pattern basically in terms of the regional vote poll, polls, which of course is where it's genuinely significant in terms of the Dems and UKIP. Talk a little bit about changes. So this is where we were uh, in terms of polling at the same time out from the 2011 uh, developed election. So Labour down substantially, Plaid and the Tories up a little, UKIP up a lot, the Liberal Democrats down, the Greens up a little but not really enough to triple the scorers. There are all kinds of problems with projecting onto, uh, projecting from opinion polls onto seats, but here's, a, here's the usual <coughs> standard UNS approach. What we see here is Labour on 27, mainly constituencies, Plaid on 13, so they would be the opposition again. Conservatives, or maybe not, we'll come back to, maybe they'll be in government again. Uh, Conservatives on 11. UKIP on 7. Lib Dems here on 2. But actually, this really points to the absurdity of the projection, because this implies the Lib Dems would win in Cardiff Central, which I think is highly unlikely. So basically, Lib Dems won or none, and you need three to have an assembly group, okay? So even if they get one, that poor person, even if they get two, which would be a staggeringly good night for them, they won't have, they won't have group rights in the assembly. UKIP, um, I don't know how closely you're following this, but we have uh, an interesting group of candidates, including, um, Nathan Gill, who is at the moment the leader in Wales, won't last long, I suspect. Mark Reckless, now last seen living in Cadfilly, uh, <laughs> which, if you know, Cadfilly is just uh, great. And, and Neil Hamilton, uh, who was, of course, brought up in Ammonford and has appears on the, is going to appear on the ballot paper as Mostyn Hamilton, his second name being Neil Mostyn Hamilton. So we're going to have. You know, this will be uh, UKIP's uh, legislative base in the UK. The Assembly will be you know, going because they consistently outpour the, the Lib Dems. Um, data on party leaders, that was quite interesting. Um, in terms of, basically, in terms of, I'm sure you're all aware of this, but it's probably worth restating in the devolved context. 
Standard question asking respondents to evaluate party leaders. And you can use this to test both visibility and popularity. So if people say don't know, we kind of, I think we can assume they've got no idea who we're talking about. So Alice Hooker Stroud, leader of the Wales Greens, of course, I'm sure you're all familiar with her, gets an incredibly high don't know rating. What we see here is that UK, and this is kind of consistent pattern, UK level leaders have a lower level of don't knows, except for Tim Farron, who uh, is not really troubling the scorers in the last context. And then in terms of Welsh leaders, well, that's Carolyn Jones, Andrew R.T. Davis, Kirsty Williams, Leanne Wood, and Nathan Gill. Uh, Jones and Wood have got, if you like, a higher visibility rating. Leanne Wood, of course, featured in the leaders' debates of the election last year, and that's had a big impact in terms of her profile, and indeed her popularity. So this is average popularity, and what we see here is Corbyn actually is doing reasonably well. Cameron's uh, fallen quite dramatically over the last few weeks in our polling. Um, Jones and Wood neck and neck. So Le Karen Jones for Labour, Leanne Wood neck and neck, but also here Kirsty Williams, to be fair to her, the very effective Lib Dem leader in Wales, is also doing uh, pretty well in terms of that. Now, in terms of the actual bat battleground, um, these are constituencies. I'm going to forget the, the lists in this context. These are constituencies, and I've colour coded them handily so you can work out which party is challenging where. Um, we've got a block of blue uh, there and some ply target seats, and then we've got this highly unlikely kind of sense of for, for the Lib Dems. The interesting thing, I don't know how well you know your Welsh geography, but the interesting thing about these seats is that you have a block in the northeast corner of Wales. Labour and Labour, six weeks ago, if we were having this briefing six weeks ago, I would have told you, look to northeast Wales, because um, the Conservatives were very hopeful and Labour were very, very nervous about that piece of the electoral battleground. There are some issues there in terms of the health service in North Wales. Well, there are some kind of local contextual issues. Also, the Conservatives got one of their most unexpected gains in the veil of COVID in the general election last year and are seen as having a very strong candidate in Wrexham. So there were areas to, to uh, there, were, there was reason to believe that North East Wales was seriously in play. The last few weeks have not been good from a Conservative perspective for obvious reasons. So at the moment, the feeling is that maybe that is not going to be as interesting as it was. Other seats to watch. Fancy is key plied Labour marginal. It's always very close. Labour have got one of their bright young things, New Waters, standing there. Um, that's good. Both parties are putting a lot of resources into that seat. From the Leanne Wood, Applied leader is on the list. She's the top candidate on the list in that part of us, but she's also standing in her native prom there, which Plaid won in 1999. Labour then responded by establishing probably its strongest local organisation in Wales there. Uh, they've got Leighton Andrews, the feisty uh, Welsh Labour politician, um, good friend of Michael Gove, um, standing there. Uh, so, um, that's going to be an interesting one. Labour should win, <coughs> um, but you know, worth, worth keeping your eyes on that particular constituency. We can talk maybe if people are interested in constituencies later. In terms of elect election issues, um, Labour ran in 2011 on a, basically on a soft nationalist ticket, standing up. There's a, there, there was a very stark difference between the way that Welsh Labour adapted to devolution as compared to Scottish Labour. Welsh Labour essentially became a small N uh, nationalist party standing up for Wales. It's been a kind of consistent theme um, and that was very much their core theme in 2011 against those nasty Tories in London. They're doing it again. Tata Steel is playing into that, so apparently it's all the fault of Westminster and so on and so forth. They're playing heavily on Carol Jones for reasons which are obvious, having seen the data. So, you know, he's the leadership figure. Um, um, they still haven't published a manifesto. That's coming out uh, today. 
part of their Scottish manifesto that's coming out next week. Yeah, still working. We're still working on it. So, um, so um, we shall see uh, what precisely they want to argue. But it, um, there, uh, in terms of the Conservatives, time for a change, obviously. Labour's record in health and education. Health, in particular, in North Wales, for reasons which I won't bore you, is a very, very, very big issue. Tax. John mentioned tax has been a big issue in Scotland. The Conservatives are trying to run tax in Wales. The problem they're having is the tax devolution to Wales is very, very, very recent. So we're meant to have partial income tax devolution to Wales, but there was going to be a referendum before we had it, which was obviously never going to be called because there were so many barriers in place of holding the referendum. The Secretary of State then announced last year that they were getting rid of the referendum requirements and that was going into the Wales Bill, which was going through Parliament. They pulled the Wales Bill a few weeks ago uh, because it was rubbish. And so, um, in a sense, we haven't got to the stage, they haven't negotiated with the Treasury on how you do tax devolution and so on and so forth. So the Conservatives are trying to make this fly, but I think it's going to be very, very difficult for them. Ply are running on time for change, obviously. Uh, Labour's kind of lack of ambition about the economy, but also Leanne, the popularity of Leanne Wood. Will she prove to be a to asset? We don't know, but they're, they're running on it. Lib Dems, um, Kirsty, Kirsty Williams is basically the only thing they've got. <laughs> it's genuinely, I mean, it's, I, it is <coughs> the stench of defeat, it's just so apparent. In anything, in any dealings that you have with the Welsh Lib Dems at the moment, it is, you know, it is a, you, you'd be a very hard hearted person not to feel very, very sorry for them. UKIP, uh, it, there, there are some policies. Mark Reckless has spent a lot of time around Cardiff Bay over the last few months, and they've got some stuff to say about grammar schools and that kind of thing. But at the moment, you know, it's not about policy. Brexit is, is the context which gives them particular attention. But there's also already falling out between them. So Nathan Gill, their party leader in Wales, has said that he regrets that Mark Reckless and Neil Hamilton are their lead candidates in two of the regions. You know, I think we can bet that this group will fall apart very, very quickly indeed. Good information, sorry, just to finish. In terms of the Welsh story so far, we've had two periods of coalition government, a uh, Lib Dem Labour coalition 2000-2003, Applied Cymru uh, Labour coalition 2007-2011, to so-called One Wales government. In 2007, interestingly, we had two options. We had the Labour Applied coalition, but also there was a possibility of a rainbow coalition which would have been Conservative, Plaid, Lib Dem. That was negotiated. And eventually, Conservative Plaid got to choose. Um, we don't have an alternative non-Labour option this time. There's no way that Plaid will deal with, certainly with UKIP, and almost certainly with the Conservatives too. So basically, we have, I think, two viable options. One is minority Labour, and of course we've had lots of experience of effectively minority Labour governments in Wales. So, for example, since 2011, <coughs> Labour had 30 seats, recall, but the presiding <coughs> office has been Labour. So basically they've been running minority governments for the last five years. Uh, in terms of the options, so minority Labour, Labour Plaid, potentially Labour Liberal Democrat, but I think that's highly, highly unlikely. Um, the tipping point in terms of when you, run, when you run a minority government is probably around 28. That's probably the number. If you, if you fall to 28 if you're late, you probably don't want to do five years of minority government, but we shall see. Um, one of the things which may be a factor here is, we, I don't know if this is true in Scotland, John, but certainly in Wales we're going to see a very large turnover of members this time. Lots of people standing down. I think we'll probably have 25 of the 60 as new members. And a lot of experience, a lot of you know, a lot of people who grease the wheels of the machine, I don't use that pejoratively, but you know, I used to negotiate behind the scenes. <laughs> they're, they're, a lot of them are going. So I think that may well have an impact in terms of 
how these things are negotiated and run and so on. So we shall see. So yeah, so that's the picture of Wales. Thank you. Thank you. Right now, Laura is in his perspective uh, the EU dimension. Now, that's the best side. So, in some ways, I, I, mine is slightly different because I've been asked to comment on how uh, the Scottish election results might impact on the forthcoming EU referendum. And the answer to that is really, really short, as there's no major political party in Scotland campaigning for Brexit, then the outcome. In, in many senses, it makes little difference in, in terms of what attitudes in Scotland are going to be um, towards the EU referendum. But the EU referendum does have really serious implications in terms of both internal Scottish politics and UK constitutional politics in terms of the place of, of Scotland in the UK and also, of course, in terms of the strength of the debate that's likely to come from Scotland in the event of something like a Brexit. Um, or any other negotiation following the, the 23rd of, of June. Um, so really the implications, if you like, are, 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 are two ways, and one of the key questions that's obviously going to come up in Scotland is the question of a, an independent referendum too. And the first thing I think that's worth saying is that, in, and again it really shows up in, in John's stats, the things that are getting talked about, it's not Brexit, it's not Europe in, in, in Scotland, it's not part of the debate, incredibly low salience, something that was already very, very heavily debated throughout the independence referendum in Scotland. It's been, if you like, hashed out, there's a very, very clear and consistent position from all of the, the, the political parties. Um, there's only one MSP, I think, on um, Margaret Mitchell, that's openly campaigning for Brexit. So the cues that are coming from the political parties to the electorate are incredibly consistent. And one of the things that we know in referenda is that those party cues really, really um, do matter. But the major question is what would happen in the event, if you like, of a, a, of a, um, a, a Brexit? Who has charge of any negotiations? Who would be responsible for that? And what are the positions on that, if you like? So one of the things that we know is that the, the referendum debate is really not discussing at all the nature of the European Union. It is discussing whether we should go in or out on the basis of current government priorities. One of the um, things that's come out is that the devolved um, governments were very little involved in the renegotiations and there's a recent report from the House of Lords Committee saying that we really felt there wasn't enough devolved input into that, given that although the European Union is a reserved issue that's dealt with by the UK government, many, many of the issues that it deals with are in fact issues of devolved responsibility and with devolved implications in terms of also paying the penalties if they fail to um, implement them. So there's a question of, of that, and there's also been this question that's it had quite a lot of resonance publicly about the date of the referendum, which is very, very close to um, the, the, the devolved um, elections, and the leaders of each of the, the parties had asked for that to be moved, so there wasn't a, a clash there, and then that wasn't moved. So that again feeds into this debate, if you like, of obviously um, disgruntlement is a way of perhaps putting it. Um, and then, of course, there is the question, in the event of withdrawal, who would be responsible for negotiating the package? Well, there's no real question. The fact is the UK government is responsible for negotiating the package with the other 27 member states. But it does raise questions in that event as to how the devolved government's policies would be heard in the renegotiation of any package with the European Union. So those are elements that are coming into, if you like, the policy debate and the, the more elite debate, but they're not spreading out widely into the public debate, with the exception part of the election date, which is kind of out there, if you like, as a, as a source of, mm, well, we asked for this and didn't get it. And those, those little sources do make some difference over, over periods of time. So one of the questions, though, in, in, in Scotland is we have this sense of Scotland being really pro-Europe, but of course we know from a real way to link to, to, to John's um, sign and see the, the election data that while consistently Scotland and to a lesser extent um, Wales but also Northern Ireland are seen to be more in favour of staying in the European Union than of leaving, they're not 
flag waving Eurofighters, they just tend to be a little bit less Eurosceptic than um, the rest of the, the UK. So if you are coming, you know, don't expect you might see the tartan wearers, but you won't see them also with the EU flags <laughs> flying them, although the expectation is that they will hope to remain in the European Union. And part of the, the story there, I think, is actually a really long-standing story, and it didn't just come out of a vacuum. One of the things that has been a long-standing pattern in Scotland, Wales, and in Northern Ireland, but much, much less in England, is much more of a sense of sending out a message that the EU and Scotland, and the EU and Wales, the EU and Northern Ireland are much more co-producers of public goods. So at a very, very basic level, the signage as you go around in Wales or in Scotland, you will find that any area where there's been EU regional funding, um, there will be a sign that will be, it uh, could be both languages, well, Wales are certainly both languages, in Scotland you've got a choice of also using Gaelic, but it will have conjoined strap lines, that, for example, in EU funds investing in Wales or uh, making for a more sustainable Scotland. So there is that sense of co-production. In, in um, England, there's never been a consistent pattern of doing that, and you will almost never see the EU flag with the English flag saying EU regional funds. It would be done much more at council level, it's much more um, loosely um, organised and it doesn't give over that constant message of co-production. So there has been a long-standing pattern, if you like, of, of that, that shared image emerging in these states that aren't just to do with immediate elections or with immediate and obvious gains in your, your pocket, but a, a general message that's been, been coming across. So one of the things we've also been looking at, and it's really interesting to look at the polls, but one of the other debates that is, is um, telling something of a story about the EU referendum and the different parts of the UK is what's going on in the Twitter sphere. Now here, obviously, you're starting to talk about absolutely massive data. There's a billion tweets in this um, particular um, part. And what you have to be really careful of is that we are absolutely not talking about public opinion polls. I think once you're starting to talk about Twitter, it becomes much more useful to think of it almost like a social anthropology or sociology where you're following the stories that people are telling to each other and, and re-echoing to those who are interested in their stories in a slightly sort of Chinese whisper kind of way. What you tend to get on Twitter, and you'll see these are perhaps surprisingly when you, you look at how close the polls are, these tiny, the dark blue parts are remain sentiment in Twitter, and the light blue parts are leave. It's absolutely common on Twitter that it's activists that speak the most, speak the most often, and speak the loudest. It's usually somebody very, very passionate about change, um, and that's consistent with what happened in the Scottish Independent referendum, where it was mostly the Yes campaign that were active on Twitter. Here it's mostly the No campaign. It gives you, if you like, some idea of salience. Um, so this sentiment looks at the types of tweets that are using hashtags or terms in them that are pro-EU or anti-EU, so things like stronger. And we have to be a little bit careful because Brexit is included in anti-EU. We initially thought that that would be neutral, that people would just use hashtag Brexit because they were talking about it. But breaking it down and actually looking at how people use it, they do mostly use it in a leaf direction, so it's not as neutral as we thought, so it is reasonable that it's in there, although that might be a, a small um, caveat on that data. Something that's really, really hard to do in Twitter is to geolocate, but it's really, really interesting. Obviously, geolocation actually depends on people switching on their geolocation, and it also depends where you are. You might be in France one day as you're, you're doing something, so you know there's always going to be something um, that you have to be careful about, but you have a massive volume of data here. So this set where we've broken it down into the geolocations, drawn on 30 million um, tweets uh, looking at the EU referendum, and it comes down to 13 million that are absolutely clearly related to the EU referendum. So it's a breakdown <coughs> of the 13 million <coughs> tweets and what people are top 20 most interesting hashtags. Now, even if you take out Brexit, so assume, and it is not, but assume Brexit itself was a neutral term then you'll find in each of the sets, um, and you've all got these tables, in each of the sets, the leave hashtags dominate. 
Also in England, in Scotland. I'll come back to each other in more detail in a moment. And in Wales. All of the dominant hashtags are for me. Even if you were to remove Brexit, and Brexit is not neutral, it is usually used in a full leave manner. What you also find is that only in Wales do stronger in and Labour for Wales come anywhere up this ranking. So these are 11th and 14th um, in Wales. In England, they're next, where you have. Um, Stronger in at number 20 of 20 hashtags, and that's consistent. In Scotland, the most interesting bit is you don't get any of the remain hashtags appearing in the top 20 at all. Now, this is probably actually because there's very little salient debate in Scotland. The expectation is that most people will be remain, and the, the tendency in Twitter is to debate something that you care about and are passionate about. If it's not really much part of the debate, then it's, it's less likely to appear in this set. But what is very, very clearly appearing in this set is Indiref and Indiref2, up in the top half of the most popular hashtags. And remember, these are the most popular hashtags when people are also talking about the EU referendum. So these are only when they're talking about the EU referendum. And that shows you what people who are active and passionate are talking about in relation to that. So just coming back to these, the other story that's worth having a look at, you can have a look at this, we have an interactive um, Twitter monitor that does this every day so you can see how it's updated in the 24 hours and also break it down by individual hashtags and how they've moved. And if you look at this over time and on a daily basis, what you find is that these shift um, when there are specific events. So media coverage and big events, so things like 19th to 20th of February, when there was the announcement of the council's decision on the new settlement, then we see a significant blip for the Remain hashtags. Similarly, on the day that Donald Tusk um, gets his letter and puts out his response to the letter, then we see a blip in the Remain hashtags. So we do actually see that there are Remain people out there on Twitter with some kind of dialogue that they want to have, but it's not as consistent, it's not as passionate, and it's not as motivated. There's simply not as much debate in that, that direction. So you can have a look at these, you can break them down. The other thing in terms of the media aspects, you can see in each of them, when you have a look at them, these have been collected since November last year, so it's one that's quite unusual in that there's a, a sort of longitudinal um, aspect to this, this Twitter analysis. It's not just all an event over a couple of days. But what you do see is how um, newspaper coverage or television coverage comes up. So uh, BBC Question Time is coming up there in Scotland. Um, I think I noticed the Marshall yeah, there in, in England. So if there's been something in particular being discussed, then people get that people feeding on about that discussion in the EU referendum. Um, so again, events are, are interesting. And the specific campaigns, leave EU, vote leave, and to a much, much lesser extent, Stronger in is really not winning out in the, the campaign on social media. And we see that through every single aspect of our, our study. We've got a separate part as well that looks at how the campaigns influence the debate, whether it feeds through the debate, and it's much, much stronger in terms of the debate. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.